Hello, welcome to this week. My name is Eva. It's so great to be with you. We are so happy you could spend some time with us, either live or after the fact. This week is a bi-weekly show on Saturdays at 2 p.m. UTC. We chat about everything from current affairs to pop culture to politics across the continent. Please remember to hit the subscribe button to follow Leaders of Africa on our YouTube channel and get notification about our event. Once again, welcome to this week, Aquaba. Aquaba. <laughs> Hi everyone, how you doing? We are fine. Hi, well, good. Well, good. How are it's you? It's so good. I'm fine, thank you. It's so good to see you uh, once again. Um, Violet, how are you doing? I I'm well, thank you, Eva. <laughs> it's good to see you too. Wonderful. How about you, Ghana? How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great, full of energy and uh, ready to go full blast today. <laughs> <laughs> great. I can imagine. <laughs> I'm waiting Ghana for that. <laughs> <laughs> as you are aware, as you are aware, there's so much going on um, in the news um, this week and also last week. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to talk about some of the important issues um, that is going on. So Violet, what is on your mind? <sighs> Eva, like you rightly said, there's a lot going on in the news. And uh, yeah. what's been on my mind has been Kenya. So uh, the Kenyans are in an uproar because of an IMF approved loan of about $2.3 billion that is meant to improve Kenya's pandemic response and basically instigate economic uh, reform in the country. And mm -hmm. typically when uh, organizations like the IMF, that's the, in the International Monetary Fund, approve um, a loan um, request from a particular African country, it's, it, you know, it's a sign of approval of the country's ability to pay back this loan, but Kenyans are not having it. So basically Kenyans on Twitter are up in arms and they are attacking both their government and also going up against the IMF. And they are saying, well, we do not need any more loans to our government because um, the money is not being spent as it is purported to be. So. Mm. Um, as of Friday, as as of Friday uh, this this week, we had um, a hashtag that was running on Twitter. It was actually trending, and it was the hashtag "Stop Giving uh, Kenya Loans." And there was also uh, a petition that was that had been started. And again, as of Friday, it had amassed up to about two hundred and thirty-two thousand signatures. That is by Friday morning. And the Kenyans are saying that uh, the IMF needs to do the right thing and withhold funds because apparently there's um, an election coming up, and they are saying that the next government will hopefully be more accountable because as of mm. now about uh 2 million uh about 2 million no ab about um I, I need to remember the, the exact uh amount of money but the, the country is losing money on a daily basis to uh corruption and i think it's about 2 million us dollars every day i need to to to, to fact check that number though it, it's gone out of my mind but right now uh, so when the country when the current government took over power in 2013 uh public debt stood at about 16 billion us dollars and now it's about 70 billion us dollars that's about four times as much and right now uh the public debt amounts to about 65 percent of gdp so of course definitely whenever this money is taken um the government says things like you know it's going to be used to create jobs to boost the economy and one of those uh projects was uh the the the, the railway line that links uh the coast to the capital nairobi and it was built using loans from china and that was launched in 2017 however apparently it's running at a huge loss right now and the government is not being very transparent about this and when it comes to things like uh creating jobs i remember in i think that was about 2017 no 2018 uh, the government, according to the National Bureau of Statistics in Kenya, the government generated just 78,000 formal sector jobs, uh, despite a growth of 6.3% GDP. However, about half a million youth enter the labor market each year. And mm. part of 
the loan money that they receive is meant to create jobs. And so somehow it is not translating as much as the, the, the Kenyan citizens want to see it translate. And uh, I don't know if we are aware, but the current, uh, the, 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 the former minister for finance, Henry Rotich, is also currently before the courts because he was accused of inflating uh, a contract for a public works project by more than $150 million. And, million dollars. and that is the minister of finance who is also supposed to be part of the guardians of the national coffers. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot really that is going on. And I can feel the, the pain of the Kenyan citizens, but I also do understand that not all debt is bad debt. So I do think that there's a, a big disconnect between the debt and what the money is being used for. I imagine perhaps the government has good intentions when it's receiving this money, but then the management of this money, I mean, there's a lot of corruption, there's a lot of uh, unaccountability, and because this money is getting lost, that is why they, it's leaving a very bitter taste in the mouths of the citizens. Otherwise, if this money was being prudently spent, then I don't think there would have been such an uproar. I don't know what the rest mm. of the team think. Yeah. But. So I have more of a question than a comment at this point. I, I'm curious to know um, when it comes to this issue of debt in this discussion or conversation, national conversation about debt, uh, what are the sort mm -hmm. of other country experiences? I know Nigeria, I think, that has had a conversation about this issue of debt, Ghana. You know, what does that conversation look like? Is it similar to that of, of Kenya that uh, Violet has just been mentioning? Uh, yeah, I mean, so it's interesting that this historical issue is still with us in Africa. And mm -hmm. uh, because uh, when you go back to the, uh, the sub era, structural adjustment era, you know, one of those demonstrations that were led in the 80s and uh, even in the uh, uh, 90s in Nigeria and some other African countries where issues, where protests around the issues of debt, you know, loans from IMF, from World Bank, and uh, people have always been expressing some reservations about how those loans could actually contribute to further underdeveloping Africa. And uh, the, the, this, I, I tend to resonate with me. The reservations tend to resonate with me. Uh, because by and large, when you look at uh, the issue of this loan, the loans, they come with a lot of, uh, when you look at the interest rate associated with this loan, uh, it, it's something that makes it difficult for countries in Africa to actually pay back the loans. And uh, for the most part, there are concerns about uh, uh, the the conditions associated with the loan, not a lot of transparency. So from the Nigerian mm. perspective, we have always been worried about the transparency associated with the loan, uh, with the citizens always in the dark about what the associated conditions are. And it's also about the issue of governance and corruption. Uh, because when you give loan to a government that is not do well in the area of governance, in the area of accountability, in the area of transparency, there's a likelihood that loan would not be used for the intended purposes, without meaning that it may eventually lead to a bad loans with the consequences and the burden of the loan pass on to the citizenry. And I think that has been the situation in Nigeria, and that has been the that seems to be the situation that is playing out in Kenya. People they seem to be going back to the to the memory lane trying to recall how such loans have actually gone the wrong way, exacerbate their livelihood condition, the economic condition of the good people of Kenya. And Nigeria is not any different because uh, when you read majority of the newspaper in the country today, people are talking about issues of bad loan, particularly from China, where the issue of transparency is not always a priority. You know, when countries in Africa borrow loans from China, you hardly get to know the conditions, the details of this loan. It's, it's a kind of mm -hmm. secret. And people, I, keep, I kept wondering, why is this the case? And for an individual to me, like me, I'm beginning to think of the need for countries of the world to move away from some of these interest-based loans. Mm -hmm. There are other ways you can fund development. We have non-interest-based loan that you can get from institutions like Islamic Development Bank. So the issue is that yeah. people that are funding you through loans, they are expected to make profit outside, out of their money. And I give a very good example. When I deal with a poor man and I borrow a poor man money 
And I know that this poor man can barely make it. You know, at the end of the day, I'm going to make more money out of the poor man and his poverty condition, my SSB. be this is the situation with many developing countries. We are dealing with serious issues of poverty. We are talking about foreign loan now. We are not talking about domestic loan because there are loans that they borrow from commercial bank domestically that government have not been able to pay. Now they are getting more loan from IMF and IMF is in the business of you know giving out loans to people, making profit out of those loans. And at the end of the day, it's their own business. It's good for the business of IMM, but it may not be good for the development of African countries. And that is why I support the good people of Kenya calling on IMF that they ought not to have given that loan to the government of Kenya. Because at the end of the day, the people know better what the situations are. So if those loans are conditioned on the element of good governance, transparency, with proper institutional mechanism in place, in put in place to ensure that the needs fully is done with, you know, it would have been a different story entirely. But yeah. the people are saying, no, those institutions, those mechanisms, those structures are not there. I go with the people because I know the situation that many African countries are going through as a result of loan. So I, 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 will, I will leave the, the conversation to other people to join, to know what the experience is like from Ghana and also from Gloria as well. Yeah, I think that was an interesting point. Oh, I need point. to make a clarification. I need to make a clarification. Like I said earlier, uh, it, it was $2 million that was being lost on a daily basis to corruption. No, it is 18.6 million US dollars that's being lost to corruption every 24 hours in Kenya. And that was according to wow. uh, President uh, Kenyatta. That's Thank a lot of money. <laughs> Thanks for that, uh, Violet. I appreciate that uh, that clarification on that. That's a very large number. And I think... One of the things to, to think about in the context of this debate, uh, this debt and this debate over debt is the distributional consequences of the money that is coming into the country, right? If the money is basically going into the hands of the elite, right, as being able to sort of keep them happy to keep that money flowing, that that becomes an issue because the money doesn't go down to the average person, right? So you're essentially taking on debt and that for on behalf of the elite and then socializing mm -hmm. that debt across the entire society, right? So right. those who are not benefiting at all will eventually bear the responsibility for that, right? Um, as opposed to those who are getting the money very quickly. Of course, that dimension may change uh, in the context of in higher levels of taxation and redistribution, right? So perhaps one of the other things to think about in the context of the, de uh, the debt debate is to ensure that there is a tax rate on the wealthy that will uh, be corresponding to the uh, payments on the debt. But of course, the elite are not wanting to do that, right? And so they're not going to right. socialize the, the cost of that debt for themselves, right? They rather sort of spread that across all of society and raise taxes in more regressive ways. Um, so I think that's the uh, other but, issue. But, but, but Peter, the issue with, this, uh, with that approach is this. When you give, that is assuming that they are distributing the loan among themselves. No, they don't do this. What they do with this loan is that they put it into projects. So the issue is, are these projects, it's, it's about the implementation of those projects. But you know, the process, Ghana, these, you know these projects though, right? The, the projects that <laughs> <laughs> take a long time to happen, um, you know, the, that, the, the projects that, and, and we know all stories, right, from, uh, from a lot of different contexts of the construction site, right? The, the long-term construction site. And that is that, that is that money that makes these projects incredibly expensive, right? And certainly enriching certain people. And then obviously mm -hmm. the economics of the project doesn't work out because of some of these higher costs mm -hmm. that are there. And then again, mm -hmm. the losses are socialized across society, whereas the benefits of that immediate loan in the short term sort of uh, area go to those people who are doing those projects, the contractors, those who are who are involved in that. Right. So I think we have to think about the distributional consequences of the of the debt. Now, if the debt was shared by all and was mutually beneficial to all, then we can make begin to make a case uh, for society taking on some amount of debt. Of course, with what you said, Ghana, caveats for transparency and governance, right? I think, but I think that is, that's absolutely key. Uh, and I think, um, again, oh my this part. is also highlight. I'm coming. So on yeah, my part, I don't yeah. have any issue. I don't have any issue with us borrowing, but a question comes to 
must we borrow must we borrow for everything you know because it looks like we are borrowing for every little thing every little problem we have to solve every little major construction work we have to stop how are we generating our resources that is something that we have to talk about where is our revenues coming from do we need to evaluate them and see how efficient they are and see those revenue generation are able to support us internally you get it and the other thing is that our tax base who and who are paying tax are the rich escaping tax mm -hmm. payment you yeah, know who's paying for the debt <laughs> at and the who end of is the paying day the yeah. tax. at the end of the day we these are some of the things that we need to ask ourselves i feel like our leaders are not being strategic in terms of thinking about ways and means to generate funds all the burden for uh, revenue generation is on tax people have to pay tax and tax and tax to finance these loans at the end of the day so when you go to our countries we have one of the highest tax rates you may think mm -hmm. about value added when you buy the thing you don't pay like the sales cash and um, the sales tax where you pay like the extra percent on the goods mm -hmm. everything is mm -hmm. added if you think about it mm -hmm. value added tax is even more than even the sales tax because it, this is how our market women yeah this is how our market women operate they don't go and buy the goods directly from the wholesalers most of them buy it from the retailers you get it. Mm -hmm. So the wholesaler put his tax, the value added. The retailer puts the value added. Then the market woman also mm -hmm. does that. So most of the time we are like paying double taxes. You know, everything is tax. Our income, um, uh, income tax is also very high because those are like the stable forms of income. Property tax, they are not really taxing it well. You know, so we need to ask ourselves some of this question. Do we need to restructure our tax base? to see that we are generating the funds, the government corporations that are making money for us, how are they doing? How are their performance? If they are not generating funds, if we are operating, we are putting in millions of money to operate some of these enterprises. And at the end of the day, we are incurring debt from this. Are we not supposed to evaluate them and see why are we putting in money and we are not making anything out of it? So these are questionable things that we have to start asking ourselves. Otherwise, we'll continue to borrow and borrow and borrow. And at the end of the day, some of our countries will be sold to um, these foreign countries that are giving us money. You know, because those loans don't come out cheap. You know, yeah. they give us the loan. Some of them is like debt forgiveness and things like that. But at the end of the day, like a lot has gone into that. You've, you've, you've constructed a project on a loan and within a year or two, the project is falling apart. You know, we, we I mean, really need to evaluate some of these things. I mean, this is an excellent question. We, I think yeah, please go ahead, out, I'll follow I, it. I think even, in my opinion, I think before we even look outwardly to condemn the institutions that give loans to our countries, I really think we need to take a very hard look at ourselves inwardly because yeah. listening mm -hmm. to all of you speak, it is an issue of governance. It is an issue of governance. We are the ones who go looking for this money. But the question is, like Eva asked, what is the tax base? Who are being taxed? How 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 fairly is the tax even being spread out? And then when it comes to issues of management, how is this money being managed? 18.6 million US dollars a day is an insane amount of money. And honestly yeah. speaking, if we did take a very hard look at ourselves as country, African countries and audited our methods of governance, perhaps we would not be crying wolf, you know. And then I also think it goes on to highlight the power of social media because before the advent of social media, we never really saw the citizens' voices this loud. Perhaps maybe mm -hmm. the voices were there, but they were not amplified. And social media has done a very huge role, played a very huge role in amplifying citizens' voices. Because I remember, for example, in the instance of Uganda a couple of months ago, we was we were supposed to have the MTV Mama Awards held in Uganda, and the citizens went on social media and made a lot of noise that the organizers had to just cancel this thing and it didn't take place. And I think that um, I'm, I'm glad that citizens are beginning to catch on onto the power that they have if they have a platform, and social media is providing that platform. Hopefully, 
maybe in the future, as citizens continue to make more noise, then they'll be able to uh, influence the government, their governments more heavily. Because I mean, you can hardly keep citizens down for a very long time because mm -hmm. I mean, your neighbors are bound to hear the noise at some point. So I'm just thinking that we do need to look at ourselves first before we begin to cry wolf at China and at these other in, uh, international uh, bodies that are giving us the, the funds or the loans, because I think the problem is really on our side. And I, th I think that the citizens need to continue to make more noise. Governments need to take more notice. And again, coming back to our systems, and we've discussed this on the show before, institutionality, mm -hmm. our systems are very weak. We do not have institutions. If only we can build institutions, then even when it comes to things like elections, when we know for sure that, okay, if a president is not doing well in the next five years, in the next four years, we will surely vote you out and our vote will count. Then, and only then, will our leaders begin to take notice and begin to take accountability. Because right now, I think there are very big loopholes where they can get away with anything, really. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Violet, you see, one of the problems I have with uh, social media is, uh, is a lot of noise, no solution. When you say no to loans, what are the alternatives? There need to be a lot of conversation about the alternative. And those conversations, they need to be compelling. So I think one of the missing issues in this conversation on social media is what are the alternatives? How do we fund development? One of the things I've been thinking about, and I've discussed this extensively with a lot of my friends who are development economists, is that uh, we can sources from the citizens to fund development. Now, I've been involved in business investment conversation with folks across different parts of the world. And what they do is this, they do crowdfunding. You see, the, the traditional approach, the problem with majority of the government across the world is that they tell us that this is the way they are doing it and everybody wants to do it that way. We need to start thinking radically, transformatively, look for approaches to fund. If I want to construct road, all that matters is mm -hmm. that I'm constructing a road. I don't need to get money from bus to construct a road. If I can pull resources together from my citizens to fund the process and make it an investment that they can recoup the interest that goes into the bank, if it goes into the citizens that are funding such a development, it's a way of creating more money for my economy, for my look for local households, for citizens in the country, rather than getting that money into the banks, into the answers and what have you. So we need to start thinking about approaches that we can afford development indigenously. Citizens need to have this conversation. And that is where we need to be seen as supporting our government to foster and engage in development projects that are really capital intensive. You see, the money that some of these institutions that they are investing, it is not that they are printing out money. You know, it's all about the power of aggregation. If I can aggregate financial resources through my citizens, I may be able to do a lot of things. So the issue is that we want to go with the mainstream approach because that is easy. It's just about sorting out the loans agreement and they give you the money, whether it becomes a bad no, the bank or the case that whenever it becomes a bad no, you have to pay back. You know, it's a different model entirely. But when it becomes an investment that involves the citizen, you see, two things will be involved. The citizens will be more concerned about how those investments will be successful because they are investors in that particular investment in an infrastructure. So they will play their part to make sure that the investment is productive, is yielding. On a situation yeah. whereby we just get the loan from one of these international development agencies, either from the World Bank or from IMF, wherever they Nobody, citizens yeah, no, so question. much interested. But 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 isn't that taxes, right? So what you're saying, you know, the the biggest crowd. No, 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 it's not taxes. The, but the the biggest crowdfunding thing that is out there is taxation, right? We, we and I think yeah. we're we're looking at the relationship here between citizens and government a di, uh, in a very bad light, mainly because that relationship isn't 
present right now, right? That there is mm -hmm. this division mm -hmm. between government and citizens. But in theory, the government is an extension of the citizens, right? The citizens are the stakeholders of the government, right? And the government's job is to crowdfund projects, right? Crowdfunding through taxation, right? Agreed upon by a majority of society in, a, in hopefully a democratic process. When you break that relationship, when you break that relationship between citizen and the state, or if we are dealing with, as we are now, post-colonial states where that relationship is not present, that becomes the issue. But once you repair that relationship, um, then you can you have that 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 close knit relationship between citizens and these projects that are ongoing or there are priorities and having them reflected in the projects that are there because individuals cannot take on uh, the entire risk of a lot of these infrastructural uh, development projects. In fact, a lot of those developers who are doing that, who are crowdfunding are themselves getting guarantees or lowering their risk because government has given them some level of support or some, you know, uh, some some sort of uh, subsidy or something of this nature, right? So I think we have to we have to not say that government is a problem. It's just that government needs to repair that relationship and build that relationship with the people that it's supposed to serve and that the people in which it's an extension would, of. Can I just can I just jump yeah, in Gloria, yeah, Gloria, uh, go on, yeah. It's not just the relationship that needs to be fixed. That can be repaired. But who is who is paying the taxes? That's the question. Eva yeah. talked about it earlier. <laughs> In the case of, of Kenya, it's it's the public that is bearing the brunt of, of this unwise economic decision. It's not the rich. It's not the people mm -hmm. who actually can afford paying back exactly. these loans. But it's the general public that is already suffering in so many ways, and especially during this pandemic. Uh, it's, mm. it's easy to understand the frustration of the people of Kenya. The general public just is not at this moment able to carry the burden of these loans. And... Um, in a space of seven years, going from 16 billion to 70, uh, 70 billion, it's crazy. I mean, uh, for mm -hmm. me, the way I look at it is that our African governments are just um, used to doing this. It's just how things have been done in the past. So we just continue borrowing and that's how things work. But as Ghana said, we need to start thinking differently. Yes, there'll still be taxes. Uh, yes, who and and. and not all debt is bad debt. Yes, mm -hmm. there might be cases where we will need to get money for different projects, but we should not rely on this current system. For me, development, the way it's practiced right now, it's just so problematic in so many ways. And we need to start mm -hmm. thinking out of the box and come up with different ideas and also look out for our, our people. I mean, um, uh, the public today is, is, is already complaining, but we look at generations down the line, that's 70 billion dead. How are generations in 10, 20 years are going to deal with all of that? So I, I just think it's a matter of just thinking differently. Come out of that system where this is how we do African government loan money from the World Bank and the IMF. This is how we fund our project. We need to consider different ideas. The ones that Ghana is talking about, and there will be cases where we'll still need, need to get some money maybe from the IMF, but it shouldn't be the way we do things. Uh, and then well, when it comes thank to you. thinking about thank you. outside the thank box. You so much. We... Thank you so much, Gloria. <laughs> um, I think that is that is very important. We have to start thinking about alternative. We have to start thinking about the next generation. You know, we can't just go for loan for everything. We have to think about alternatives, as Ghana has said. Um, so we will now move on to the next thing. I have a quiz for you, Gloria. Um, oh, wow. I have a quiz question for you. Yeah. So um, <laughs> why did... Yeah. So here is a quiz question. So why did the African Union um, drop the plan to secure um, the AstraZeneca vaccine from India? Uh yeah so first of all the astrazeneca vaccine um has been facing a couple of issues in the news about potential blood clots and all of that so that was a controversy that the science scientists came out and said uh these are outliers it's normal certain isolated cases like that can happen but in the case of the eu it was because of supply i think the eu were not sure whether they can secure the AU. I mean, the AU, sorry, the AU, uh, we're concerned on whether they can secure enough supply. Right. That's correct. Yay. So, 
<laughs> yeah, and supply is becoming an issue in India um, because also the COVID-19 cases in India is surging. Um, so mm. in terms of um, buying it from there is becoming a major issue. So they are looking at elsewhere and also other vaccines to buy it, to supply it on the continent. Um, so Gloria, what is on your mind for this week? Yes, um, so this week uh, we're still in East Africa. This time we turn to Ethiopia. As you all know, the crisis in Ethiopia has been going on for like five, six months now already. And uh, so there's a um, singer, The Weeknd, that is the name by which is 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 mostly known. Uh, but his, his, his full name is Abel Makonen Tesfaye. He came out this week on his social media platforms to uh, announce that he was going to donate one million US dollars towards relief efforts in Ethiopia. So that money is going to go, uh, is, is going to be donated through the UN uh, food program, and it's going to help fund two million uh, meals for people in the regions of Ethiopia who are currently going through this crisis. And uh, so he um, he's known for being generous and being um, interested in some of the crises going on in the world and not just um, in Ethiopia. He was in the U.S. He was involved in supporting efforts during the Black Lives Matter protests that took place uh, in 2020. And he also gave some of his money to a crisis in in, uh, in Beirut a couple of years ago. So um, it's good to see that people who have the resources and they have a platform are sending a message. And for me, one of the most important things that he did is not just give the money, but in doing so, he encouraged people to other people to do the same. So basically, he used his platform to draw attention to the crisis in Ethiopia and encourage people who are able to to also um, donate to this uh, to these relief efforts. So that's the story. Oh, wow. I know, I know, yeah. I know. There's a day we talked about on this show uh, concerns about the <laughs> app. <laughs> are the rich people doing enough to address some of the issues yes. in our world? Yeah. You know, remember, yeah. Uh, so this is just one of the many efforts and one of the many different ways where people who have money or resources can support some of the pressing issues in our world today. So this story um, helps us again get back to that conversation to discuss are the rich doing enough? So Gloria, I mean, I should we say they're watching the, the show and are now responding? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so 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 me, so I consider it to be changing the narrative. Uh, because mm -hmm. uh when issues like this happen in Africa, uh it's the donations are usually coming from outside of Africa. And mm -hmm. uh, that makes people not to give Africa the respect the continent deserves in the committee of other continents in the world. Because they're always like Africa is always taking without giving. And this is a very good example that is changing the narrative that is not just given to Africa, he has given to places outside of Africa. And this is encouraging. This is what we are calling on everybody in Africa to do. Uh, when there are crises, there are many ways you can help to solve contribute to de-escalate and to attend to some of the emerging issues, you know, consequences of the conflict. Money is just one of the ways we can do that. So mm -hmm. one of the things that we are the leaders of Africa, we are calling on the younger generation of people in Africa to do is to start a volunteer initiative. People can start to cross for money to help support our people in Ethiopia that are going through one form of distress or the other as a result of the escalating crisis over there. There are ways people can fundraise even time and effort. There are ways that people can fundraise to leave materials from across different African countries. That little thing that you think is not enough, when we aggregate all of those together, we go a long way to put smiles on the faces of our people in Ethiopia that are going through our time as a result of this. We applaud the effort of somebody donating about $1 million. That is massive. That is coming from an individual. But what we want our people, our viewers, particularly the younger generation in Africa, to do is to take over such initiative. On this process, let you be known 
as changing the narrative. Mobilized resources, intellectual resources may be one of the ways you can help. There are some of these kids who are currently out of schools. There are ways you can start something, you know. Maybe you want to start an initiative, pull resources together, form association of concerned individuals from across the continent, outside of the continent, and start contributing something. We can make this happen. When we start this way, then we are laying down the foundation of something that may become bigger. Africa may become, may at a point in time, maybe in the next five years, may be exporting support to various places in the world where there are crises in one way or the other. So this this, this, this is something very applaudable and uh, something we've been calling to the leaders of Africa. And we are so glad that some of them that have the resources, they are beginning to listen to us. Now we are now addressing our concern to the people of Africa, not just the rich people, everyone. We are the leaders of Africa. We are addressing our concerns to all of you that you need to start doing something. You can do something. Not thinking of doing something is the problem. Not, not having the means. There are many ways you can support. The moment you assume, you begin to think I can do something, then the ideas regarding what you can do with the little you have to support and ease our people through the situation, the problems, the challenges they are fi finding uh, facing in Ethiopia, easing them out of those, then it, it becomes a, it, it becomes easier easier done than said. So we want you to please think about this and work assiduously towards giving something to alleviate the challenges of our people in Ethiopia. And I want to add, okay, um, add so in right here, Eva, before you, before you go, one, one thing, just a little bit of a background on the weekend, right, in terms of biography so that we can reflect yeah. on this. So uh, he was uh, the son of Ethiopian immigrants, so he has a connection to Ethiopia, uh, and he is a Canadian, right? So he is in the diaspora, what we would say is the diaspora. So I think this also raises questions and mm. um, thought about the role of the diaspora in terms of giving back. And as we all know, the African Union designates the diaspora as what it calls the sixth region, right? The sixth region. And they're hoping to engage the diaspora in terms of supporting a lot of their programs, emergency relief, but also more structural investments uh, on the continent, right? So they've been emphasizing this. And so I think this also allows us to reflect on what are the responsibilities of people in the diaspora, right? Oftentimes the responsibility is to one's family uh, or family members that are that are back home but perhaps we have to think about that in terms of a broader commitment there right or, or perhaps a, a more uh, of a structural commitment as well right in some countries around the world taxes and resources are demanded of their citizens who are living abroad who are working abroad right so mm -hmm. I think we also have to think about giving back but we can also think about formalizing that relationship between the diaspora and and, and countries and the African Union itself uh, uh, in in more formal ways as well. Yeah, S totally. So, um, my thought is that the issue in Ethiopia has been going on for some time now, and the relief efforts and the money that is coming in is really good. These are these are um, short term solutions to the problem, but we have to start thinking about long term. The conflict is still going on. What are people saying? What are ordinary citizens saying about this conflict? Because we also need our voices heard so that it will send a message that the conflict needs to stop. You know, we don't need to wait for another Rwanda genocide to occur before we will raise up our voice to say that this is going on. Right now, the news media is not focused so much on Ethiopia. It's not talking about what is going on. But a conflict is going on day in and day out. Even in um, Mozambique and all these things, there are a lot of terrorist attack and a lot of instability going on in these places. It's time we talk about it. It's time African Union engage some of these countries so that wars and also civil uh, um, civil conflicts don't, don't go on forever. It's been over six months and the issue has not been resolved. You know, we need to talk about it. Parents, children are getting stranded. Families are getting stranded. People are losing family members. You know, and this is just too much. Providing money, yes, they need the food. But what is the long-term solution here? 
that is something that we need to br- bring attention to. That is something that we need to start talking about. Because this war, this um, civil conflict needs to stop. You know. Yeah, Eva, I like that you brought... To something. Yeah, you you bringing up that point of what is being done to bring this conflict to an end. And unfortunately, the situation in Ethiopia reminds me of cases in, in many other parts of Africa. It feels like when this started, there was a lot of noise in the news, there was a lot of um, attention into Ethiopia, and we covered it for some time, and then the story just died down for some reason. It just like mm-hmm. went quiet. But the thing is, in that country, that crisis has not has not become better. I mean, things are still worse as they were a couple months ago. But um, I feel like, I don't know, people become desensitized with this crisis. Reminds me of the DRC. This crisis has been going on for years. And I, if you follow the news and hear about the kind of massacres that are going on in this eastern part of the Congo, what's going on in Ethiopia, look at Central African Republic. I'm just wondering, do we just get tired of these stories at some point and just we let things happen? Mm. I. I don't know what the solution is, but I would like to mention in the case of Ethiopia that um, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and uh, the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission, they launched a joint investigation into possible crimes. Again, this is just an investigation. Um, it's not going to solve the problem, but I guess some some organizations on the ground and outside are, are doing something. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. um let's come back. Let's Sorry. come to Peter. Yeah, Peter, so much is going <laughs> on. A lot of <laughs> a lot of things are happening in our world today. Um I, I want to come back to you and ask you what is on your mind. I don't get a quiz question, Eva. No, you are spared today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> So what's on my mind is the uh, change of power or the cha- I should say the changing of the guard at uh, an organization called Afrobarometer. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, Afrobarometer is the um, largest uh, sort of public opinion pan-African survey of African is- uh, issues or opinions on governance, democracy, elections, society, economics as well. Uh, and they have had a, a CEO for some years. Uh, his name is Professor Ajima Bwadi. He is uh, from Ghana. Um, and he has just stepped aside. He's re- retired. And now we have a new uh, CEO. And I want to reflect on the legacy of Professor Ajima Bwadi because I think he plays an important role in bridging oftentimes this division between those who are doing research uh, in an academia and those who are doing advocacy work. Uh, that is very meaningful uh, for people uh, in their country. Um, And so just a little bit about him. He was profiled in Financial Times, uh, the Financial Times in the last week. And so just a couple of of pointers. So as I mentioned, he was one of the key founders of the Afrobarometer Project back when it was being piloted in 1999. Um, and he, he comes from, a, as he says, a small village uh, in, uh, in uh, Ghana. Uh, maybe, Eva, you know of this, uh, this place, Ibrium. Uh, so that's where he said he was, uh, he, he was from. <laughs> and Eva, you, want, you know it? Um, I've heard about it, but it's, I've not been there before. Yeah, I, I, I can imagine. So he, he did his undergraduate at the University of Ghana and then his PhD at the University of California, Davis. Uh, and interestingly enough, he's a very, and I, I think this speaks to his sort of international profile. He married an American wife who is a diplomat. So his wife was traveling from different places, predominantly in African countries, uh, for example, in uh, Nigeria, Swaziland, uh, for example, uh, postings there. So he was traveling around and, as part of uh, his time uh, in on the continent of Africa, he also founded the Center for uh, Democracy and Development, CDD Ghana, um, with a loan. So he founded uh, CDD Ghana, which becomes the core partner of Afrobarometer. And I think one of the things that we can take away from his legacy was, as he says, research for advocacy purposes. So I think we can be kind of c- encouraged by... Um, 
his life experiences to make sure that when we're doing research, if we're doing research, that it really makes a difference in people's lives and we're able to bridge that that uh, that gap. So I want to congratulate Professor Bordi on his retirement uh, and then also celebrate uh, sort of this this legacy, this model of scholarship that perhaps we can we can discuss and embrace. Amazing story. I like the fact that the Financial Times did this story on him and how that story started. Uh, they rightfully mentioned that usually you read about this story after the person has died. Why do, why do we have to wait when the person is gone? We have to celebrate uh, people. Exactly. People like, um, yeah, like Mr. Boadi. He's done a great job. Uh, bringing research and advocacy to to it to another level and uh, it's, it's 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 great that we're celebrating him today on the show yeah we really need to give him his flowers <laughs> yeah yeah I, and, yeah so so I'm, I'm curious ghana you always talk about this this model of the scholar <laughs> activist right <laughs> <laughs> the, the, you know that those that are involved in scholarship and activism so you know what are some pointers because we know that a lot of people watching the show are interested in research and and uh and advocacy as well so i mean what advice can we give uh people about uh you know making sure they're bridging that gap that often is is there i think this is very important uh particularly in a democracy uh, because uh, advocacy is not just about protest, because people have often think that advocacy is about protest, it's about saying no to everything that the government is doing. That, I think that's a wrong understanding of what advocacy should be, from our own opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, advocacy means that we are building, bringing, uh, putting the government on its toes, at the same time, putting compelling alternative to the table and uh, this is what our barometer has taught every one of us, that there are ways we can work with citizens to get data that we can use to drive good governors. This is one of the things that uh, our colleagues who are working in uh, the advocacy spaces can learn from uh, Afro barometer. Uh, I mean, because everything that we talk about when it comes to governance, they are not just things that we make up from our brain. They are things that should be reflective of the thoughts of the people, that should be backed up by hard data, data that are telling us, that, look, let's go back to the issue of debt. If people are not happy about the issue of debt, it's not enough for people to just assemble themselves on Twitter and that say, no, debt is mm -hmm. bad, it's this, it's this and that. We need data that says that debt is bad. And that tells us that this alternative, when you follow this alternative, you are going to get this kind of result. This is the kind of thing that we get from the data that Afro Barometer makes accessible to everybody. You know, the data, they are high quality data that you can even use to address many of the issues that are affecting the society. The, the data are not just focused on the problem. The data, they also give you insight into potential solutions because they are interested in using advocacy to highlight the problem and advance solutions to the problem. This is one of the things, this is one of the things that uh, our friends and colleagues that are working in the advocacy spaces need to learn from his life and his commitment and, uh, and from the broader values that Afro Barometer as an entity stand for. And I think this is what we call to our the leaders of Africa as well. We support advocacy, but not advocacy for the sake of advocacy, advocacy for the sake of progressive and intended development that is all embracing, that is all encompassing. This is my take home from his life and his contributions to advocacy, particularly retooling advocacy, making it to be more focused and purposeful. We have gone beyond the era of military government whereby it's all about protests, it's all about going to the street, taking on the government. This is the time for citizen-led governance. And that is what advocate, Afrobarometer stands for. That is what we stand for, the leaders of Africa, and that is what we are calling to in the civil society spaces as well. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Professor Jima has been very instrumental, even when it comes to democratic democratic governance um, in Ghana. 
um, because as Peter said, he founded CDD Ghana and CDD Ghana has been very instrumental when it comes to talking about um, um, good governance um, and democratic ideas. Um, and also they've also been very, very instrumental when it comes to election related issues on the continent of Ghana. I remember that anytime we approach an election, they will come out and start educating citizens on important things, what they need to know. They will um, have conferences questioning some of the um, things the government is doing. So CDD Ghana has actually also helped a lot of Ghanaians, especially those who follow CDD Ghana and also pay attention to some of the things they are doing. Um, they've been very educative. Um, they've been, they have been very good in opening our eyes to see some of the issues that we have to think about and also reflect on. I remember that um, four years ago and also um, during the past elections, Right now, most um, TV stations and also radio stations always go and check on Afrobarometer data mm -hmm. regarding elections and report it and say that this is what Afrobarometer has found. This is what citizens are saying about this election and this government and this person, you know, and politicians are starting to take some of these issues really serious. I remember that um, during just last election in December, one of the Afrobarometer dispatch that came out was talking about the fact that people uh, really want the president, like the current president of Ghana. Um, they really have a high opinion of him. So, that was what they were talking about. Well, that was what you could hear people saying and also the radio stations and the TV stations pick it up. And truly, when the election um, ended, they won the election. So Afrobarometer has been very instrumental. And just yesterday, I was going on one of the uh, radio stations, their website, to check what is going on. And they have actually reported one of Afrobarometer dispatches about taxes, saying that most Ghanaians don't know how their taxes are being used for development uh -huh. purposes. And you know, and this is very <laughs> instrumental. This is very key. And thanks to Professor Jima and other uh, members who founded Afrobarometer, we now have information about what citizen thinks. You know, and also when politicians don't know what people really think about some of the things they have to do, they are doing. They should consult Afrobarometer because they have a lot of questions talking about development, talking about taxes, oh. talking about corruption, and even trust in the government. You know, mm -hmm. so I I just want to thank Professor Jima for his excellent work um, towards the development and also um, the promotion of democracy on the continent of Africa. And just and just adding to that, uh, just just one quick note, uh, Glory, before you jump in, the the author of that taxation paper that just came out, that author that of that paper you've just mentioned, was a scholar of the Leaders of Africa Institute, Isaac Borte. So we can also congratulate him on his publication yeah. because it is making oh, no. waves in in the public discourse in Ghana. It was all about sort of tax compliance, why people uh, you know embrace taxation, whether they're paying tax. A, a topic we were talking about earlier. So that's one of the scholars at our institute. So congratulations to Isaac. Yeah, go ahead, Gloria. Oh, Sorry, okay. I wanted to add that. <laughs> yeah, there, there's no doubt that Afrobarometer has done a great amount of work on the African continent. Uh, but I have a personal vendetta against Afrobarometer because <laughs> in all its, <laughs> in all its years, yes, I think does not conduct research in I the DRC and exactly and oh. a lot of countries that they've left out as Central African countries and I've always asked the question why I'm really hoping and looking forward to that the person who's taking over will consider expanding in Central Africa it is high time we are waiting sir Mr. Professor oh. Joseph Asunka we are looking forward to you moving into Central Africa and including this region of Africa into the work that Afrobarometer is doing that's all <laughs> No, no, I think you're right. And, and that data is so important. That No, I, I yeah, think you're yeah. absolutely right, uh, Glory, on that point. That data is very important because um, we look at one Central African country that is covered, Gabon. And what you realize about the figures mm -hmm. in Gabon was, you know, a few years ago they had an election in 2016. It's very likely the president lost based on the, the very poor public opinion uh, that people had of the current president. And so I think particularly mm -hmm. when we're dealing in Central Africa, with these more autocratic regimes in particular, in particular where there's been a fair amount of unrest, we can begin to understand the nature of that and have a, a national conversation about it. I think um, one of the difficulties doing surveys in Afrobarometer's defense in more authoritarian contexts 
uh, is that, uh, you know, the government is always is not always amenable to these surveys being fielded in their backyard. Mm -hmm. And I'll take one example of this, the Gambia. The Gambia used to be not a part of the Afrobarometer for many, many years, right? That was when uh, Yahya Jameh was in power. After he was uh, voted out of office and pushed out of office by ECOWAS, they started in and, and did a survey in the Gambia. But of course, the Gambia is also a very a small country in terms of population, so it was also very easy for them to come in there. But obviously, our hope is that uh, they'll be in the DRC to get uh, a good uh, sort of, uh, you know, nationally representative view about what people are thinking. But of course, as we can imagine, there are challenges, logistical challenges and security challenges as well. When when we think about the survey in Nigeria and, and, and in Mali in particular, there were some areas that were no-go areas for the survey because of issues of insurgency, and they always have to keep a numerator safe. So that's also a, a consideration that's there. But yeah, you're right. Uh, uh, Expand uh, uh, into Central and Africa. Then, <laughs> yeah. And then the other way we can think about this is this, Peter. We can begin to localize a for barometer, like say Niger barometer, Congo barometer, Ghana barometer, so that uh, each of these country they take ownership of that data at that level. Uh, part of that might be that you know that we are also helping them to build that uh, institutional in-country capacity to collect data at that level. And these are other areas that uh, our friends in different civil society spaces they can begin to advance this conversation with a barometer. What are the ways that we can come together, form a partnership, and start a national level chapter of Afrobarometer? The, the good that news, the good news, Ghana. The good news is that's already happened. <laughs> that's already oh, happened. That's, that's great. <laughs> that's yeah, and I think. I, I think. Um, I think that's the legacy of Professor Jima Abuadi oh, is the is the movement of this project from the University of Cape Town, Michigan State University, uh, as well as CDD Ghana to have these natural uh, national partners. It's a network strategy, right? So they hire and they contract and they work with national partners within each of these countries. A civil society organization that does work, for example, in public opinion research, and so one of the larger pieces of Afrobarometer these days are training of researchers, training of those that are a part of those organizations to do and conduct that work, right? And they emphasize that it is African-led, uh, a project that is African-led. Unlike many research mm -hmm. projects that begin in Western countries, they stay in the Western countries. They want to take all that grant money. They want to keep it there. But Professor Jima Bwadi, as well as uh, Professor Michael Bratton, as well as uh, Professor Bob Mattis, the three sort of key founders of Afrobarometer, have put an emphasis in ensuring that it builds local capacity in the context of doing this research. And I think one of the testaments of that is what Eva has mentioned, is that local people don't view this as some sort of Western research uh, project that is coming up with these ideas from far abroad, right? No, it is an, an, a local NGO that's presenting the results that they've analyzed, that they publish the papers mm -hmm. locally, uh, and then they're shared across the Afrobarometer network. But I think your key point, Ghana, is right. We need need more Afrobarometers. We need more strategies that uh, make sure that we're not only, you know, doing research and advocacy, but research that is that is really seriously building capacity in national partners uh, uh, that are there. And I think oftentimes those grants have a little bit of that. But at the end of the day, the paper is published. The collaborator that's at, say, at the University of Ghana or UC Berkeley are both happy. They both got their publication and it ends there. But again, we, it has to be a further, more sustained project. Uh, and it has to take on a new understanding, as you mentioned, Ghana, and, and alluded to, of what partnership really means in, in this sort of global conversation about uh, equity of, of knowledge production. So, uh, I think Jima Bwadi is, again, another example of, of what that can look like in, in, in a good way. Uh, and, and he was uniquely positioned to do that. Okay. All good things must come to an end. To <laughs> Why? So much. Oh, there's the drum. <laughs> yeah. Thank there's you. The drum. Yeah, you can hear the drum. You can hear the drum. You can hear the drum. So thank you for joining us today, either live or after the fact. We will see you again in two weeks for this week. In the meantime, hit that subscribe button to subscribe to Leaders of Africa YouTube channel and also join our Discord community to continue the conversation and also for future programs alert. 
Thank you so much mm. for joining us today. That is all for this week. Until next time. 